Okay, without further ado, Jennifer is the Energizer Bunny. I had an entire thing to read about her, <laughs> but I'm going to let her activities speak for themselves. And you can hear me. I have been running a group. I'll just tell you briefly a little bit about me. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, had my own UFO sighting in two, well, actually in 1975, when I was 19 years old. It profoundly affected me, but I didn't know that it was a real thing because it happened so early in the morning. I found out 20 years later, somebody else in my house at the same time saw the same thing. Actually, it was 25 years later. Uh, I had been journaling, and I had written it down in my journals, but I, I didn't know that it was really real until someone else approached me and said, what happened when we had that UFO sighting? That was in the year 2000. And pretty much at that point, I realized, okay, this is real. Either I keep it in my gray box, like I have for 25 years, or I move forward in my life, and I start to go to UFO conferences, and I start to learn, and I start to study. So I was approached by MUFON and asked if I would start an organization because they needed one in our area. So in 2000, basically, right after 9-11, actually, it was 2001, I... Um, had one of my first programs at a local library, and I've been doing it for 20 years now, uh, every month for free. I invite a speaker. We have a little mini conference, sort of like this. I get between 50 and 60 people, I did before COVID, coming and hearing speakers. Joe Foster came down a number of times to speak. I have these little pamphlets and brochures in the back you can pick up. And these, if you pick one up, now you can go online because I've been videotaping these programs because I'm a filmmaker and Bob Terrio has been helping me. So you can go and look at almost 20 years worth of programming. So you want a free education, just pick this up. You have to go to the website and go to the video page and then just start to click on some of the programs. And it's really quite interesting. So my presentation is called, and I know we have some chatter going on in the room and it's a little hard to hear, so I'm going to suggest if you want to have a conversation with someone, since there's a lot of acoustical echo in here, just zip into the other room right down the hall. And if you need the bathroom, it's also right out there down the hall. My presentation is called UAPs 101. It's basically, if you know nothing about the UFO topic, you're going to get like an overall basics of it historically from the ancient past right up to the current day and we're going to talk a little bit about what is significant that has changed since 2016. Um, I've already told you how, whoa, let me go here to play. <laughs> I'm, I've already mentioned about um, Marconi, who bought property right here in 2012 and put up the first satellites. These are what some of the first radio telescopes look like. This is what we were going to take you to right down the street and let you see things, let you see what's going on. Yesterday, I bounced my voice off the moon. That may not happen for you, but you can come back here any time and go see that. It's uh, literally, uh, you could walk to it from here, or maybe if you're a good throw, throw a stone to it from here. But this is an example of what these early radio telescopes look like. Um, and I mentioned before, this is, became the home of RCA, also the US Army Signal Corps. Uh, worked out of here. This is very interesting. This is Bell Labs, or what's called Lucent Labs. It's not far from here. This whole building was built to look like a semi-resistor. The whole building itself looks like a computer transistor, and the whole thing's like a mirror. It's a really interesting complex in Homedale, right around the corner from here. Um, and of course, we used to have satellites like this on the ground. Now, all our satellites mostly and our telecommunications is up in space. And this is why we are seeing and hearing incredible things that relate to the UFO topic. So just to give you a sense of where we are, this is where we are. This is the museum that's here. This is where the Pacific, I mean, sorry, the Atlantic Ocean is right out here. Just to back up a little further, you can see New York City here. This is Montauk, Lock Island. This is where we are. Radio telescopes in both places were very, very significant in protecting us during the Second World War and letting us know whether or not we had an invasion going on. So to begin my talk today, I'm going to break it up into like seven basic sections. So you can just kind of wrap your brain around this. First, we're going to talk about Sumer. 
ancient Sumer, three, 4,000 BC, um, Sumerian culture, what they knew. We'll look a little bit at some artifacts. We're gonna talk about Ezekiel's wheel. Then we're gonna go and jump into 15th century Renaissance paintings. You may not know, but lots of painters, you know, uh, captured very, things that look just like UFOs. Then we're gonna look at uh, some newspaper articles from the early 1900s, like 1899, 1900. Then we're gonna jump into the 1947, uh, 48 to 53 period of time. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about currently what's going on right now. So that's sort of an overview of my presentation. And now I'm gonna jump back to the top of my presentation because I didn't have time to put this, un whole, put this all in the right order. But now we're gonna jump here right into Sumerian cylinder seals and Zachariah Sitchin. I was really blessed. Um, I got to become very good friends with Zachariah and I ended up doing some film work for him and I used to set up conferences and things like this for him. And I'd meet him for lunch. I'd go up to New York with my family to see theater in the days when you could still do that. And when Zachariah was living, we would always meet for lunch and talk. And uh, so Zachariah wrote huge numbers of books. I highly recommend if you're interested in the ancient uh, knowledge about the UFO phenomenon and ancient history, you go and find him. He made very many things uh, simple to understand because he was a scholar. He was born in Russia, moved to Israel, spoke multiple uh, languages, understood um, Hebrew and um, Aramaic language because he went to a yeshiva in Israel, grew up there. His, par his parents moved from Russia to Israel. So he spoke multiple languages already at a very young age. Then he learned and taught himself cuneiform and he started to read the cuneiform tablets. And he began to realize because he went to a yeshiva, which is like a Jewish school that teaches Bible study right along with mathematics and you know algebra and everything else, he realized that the Bible story existed in the cuneiform tablets way far back and nobody really realized it. Just the names were changed sometimes, like the story of Cain and Abel and the story of Genesis and the story of the great flood and all of that was all in the cuneiform tablets and they were talking about a period of time 10,000 BC. So we don't really understand Bible history, but Zach always did. And that's what really impressed me about Zachariah. He is here holding a large cardboard printout or picture that he had printed of a cylinder seal that he discovered in the Pergamon Museum in, um, where's the Pergamon? Uh, in, um, it's in Germany. I'm blanking the name of the city. It starts with a B, sorry. <laughs> Berlin, it's in Berlin. On this cylinder seal, and I'll tell you a little bit what cylinder seals are, but on this cylinder seal, you see two people standing and a king sitting. Just notice for a moment the king who's sitting, his, the head of his height, his head height where he's sitting, is the same height as the standing people, okay? So that pictorial image shows you that this king was big, he was a big you know, maybe 12 feet tall, 10 feet tall, and these standing people are about maybe five feet tall. So, and what's also really important is there is a solar system depicted on the cylinder seal. That solar system is identical to the size and shape of the planets in our solar system, except there's one more planet. So one of the famous books he wrote is called The Twelfth Planet, really it, it kind of meant that it was like the ninth planet in our solar system, but that's a long story because some planets have moons around them and things like that. But um, very, very significant work, and I highly recommend you look up Zachariah. Okay, let me see if there's anything in mind. Some of this presentation I'm gonna be reading to you because I think that it's very, very important. One of the other things I wanna tell you about the Sumerian uh, cylinder seals and the Sumerian history, is they had predictions that were accurate astronomical predictions of comet appearances. These were found in Ur by this famous guy named Woolley in 1932. They showed astronomical predictions of comets that were appearing, comets we didn't even know about at that point. So it was a 50-year prediction chart. They also had 50-year in advance predictions of eclipses, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. And when we figured out what that was, we were shocked because these records were created 
in, in mud clay with stylists in 4000 BC. So uh, it just shows you that there was an advanced civilization in the past. Now the Sumerian culture had many, many, many uh, very interesting temples that were built in what we know as the Fertile Crescent, which is right between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And it, it kind of makes up today what is southern Turkey and parts of Syria and Iraq. Those two big rivers are right between there. So this is where we know, we think, early civilization began and city-states began. But just take a look at, these are stone-carved stelas that are life-size, right? They're on the walls of these temples, where they were. And in them, I don't know if you can see, but in the very bottom here, you can see it looks a little ripply in the bottom of this picture. They created these carved stelas, and on them, there were cuneiform script written right across them that described the stela right on the picture. It was really a fascinating way of communicating clearly for future generations their history. And of course, there's all these depictions of men with bird heads and wings. Sometimes they have bird feet, sometimes they have claw feet, like, or sometimes they have hoofed feet. It's really weird. This is another depiction. Uh, and this is from the, um, I think this is the Metropolitan Museum in New York, or it may be the British Museum. I've spent my life going around traveling to them. I want you to notice these two figurines. Okay, that's really interesting. And you might see better, actually, if we close that shade right over there, if you want to try that, Chris. Is it Chris? Yes. Yeah, Chris carried my bag in this morning. So these are... Um, large, they look like horses or bulls. They have bull feet, they have wings on them, and they have human faces. Yeah, I think that's a little better, thank you. And this, of course, is a full man. He has human feet, he's holding a little bag, and he's also holding this interesting little, maybe some kind of cone. We don't really know what that is, but right across the front there's cuneiform that describes him, and of course he has wings. So these are the types of icons that come out of what's called the Near East, if you go to a museum. Now this is a cylinder seal. I was showing you earlier what Zachariah was holding a picture of. So this is a small object that's usually about an inch and a half big, okay? So it's pretty teeny, and it is all carved out very finely in reverse so that when you roll it out in something like Play-Doh or wet mud clay, it creates an image. Here, up here, you can see, although the lighting isn't really great here, and for some reason, the, the brightness on this, let me see if I have my brightness all the way up. I do. I think the brightness on our projector is not um, up all the way. But it, these show you little cylinder seals being rolled out into wet clay. So these cylinder seals were basically used to denote your status. Say if you were a doctor or you were a lawyer or you were a priest or you were a financer or you were a farmer, you could make tablets in clay which, and then roll this out as a signature for yourself either at the bottom of the tablet or they would cook tablets like in ovens like they make bricks or we make pottery today. This is what they were using and these denoted various people's uh, positions. Just take a note here, this is a little cylinder, a flying cylinder with three little beings in it, right here. And it looks like these two guys are standing over something that kind of looks like maybe a communication device, maybe talking with the guy above them. This is another Stella, I don't know if you can see this, there are wings coming out of each side, there's a circular disc here in the middle, and there is a guy in that middle disc kind of interesting. Here's another picture of it. Here's a friend of mine standing in a museum next to a display and she's showing you like how big these cylinder seals are. Teeny, teeny, teeny. These are artifacts that come out of Israel dating back to 3000 BC. These are kind of unusual looking beings. These are two women. Um, they seem to be holding their breasts up, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> and uh, they are... Um, People refer to them as lizard-headed beings because they look a little reptilian, which is kind of interesting. Here are some more lizard-type beings. These have come from southern Mesopotamia. They go back to 5000 uh, BC. They're found in Ur. Um, really quite fascinating. 
this little guy here is a metal sculpture. He came out of Kiev, Ukraine, and he dates back to 4000 BC. He looks like an astronaut to me. <laughs> here, this woman, although she's headless, she is holding an infant in her arms, and the infant is nursing. If you look at the head of the infant, it is elongated, tall and elongated, with a high back, much like we saw Nefertiti and Akhenaten in Egypt, right? And it has a very large eye right here. So I don't know if anybody wants to play, if Bill or Dave want to play with trying to bring the brightness up on the projector, but you're welcome to try while I'm presenting because people could see it better because it looks awfully sort of dark to me. But So these are, this is another lizard type woman with very large eyes, right? She comes uh, out of Iraq from 4000 BCE and she resides in the Istanbul Museum today. This is an astronaut from the Istanbul Museum in a little spaceship or spacecraft, right? He is headless. What's interesting about this spacecraft is in the back, it's got a large, um, like, round exhaust, a central exhaust engine ring, and there are four different types of uh, uh, explosive areas on the back of that, or four different rockets inside that ring, much like we have today when we launch rockets up, like all the Apollo rockets we sent up and the Mercury rockets look just like that. Zachariah found this in a museum. It was in one of those cases, sort of in the Istanbul Museum. He asked the museum curators to pull it out, and what they did promptly after that is hit it, so you can't see it anymore. This happens a lot. These are from a museum in, um, oh, I guess that's getting too bright, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Anyway, these, these are uh, characters that are in uh, Mexico City, and they, off, they really look like astronauts to me. Here's a current day astronaut, and those are the ones coming from the Mexico Museum. So we're gonna talk now about Ezekiel's wheel. This is a biblical story from 545 BCE. So this is just before you know, the change of the era, just before the time of Christ. Uh, the book of Ezekiel in chapter 10, verse 9. This is the basic story. A young boy who was about 13 years old was standing alongside of the Kaibar River, which is located in present-day Iraq, and he witnesses the sky or the heavens like opening up and he sees what he describes as visions of God that appear. So the written description reads, he saw an immense cloud with flashing light surrounded by brilliant light the center looked like a glowing fire that seemed to come alive with four living creatures in it. These living creatures appeared in human form, but each had four faces and four sides and four wings. Their legs were straight, but their feet were those of a calf. Remember what we looked at in Sumer? You had humans sometimes with the feet of birds or calves. They had human hands. Further descriptions later down in the text say, each of the four sides of the faces were different. One side of the face was human. Another side of the face was a lion. Another was that of an ox. And another was that of an eagle. Now, this is hard to wrap your brain around. I can't understand how a being can have four sides and four faces and four wings. And you can have wheels inside of wheels. but. This is the description in Ezekiel's Bible, from the Bible of Ezekiel's wheel. Very famous. Now we're going to jump into paintings. This is a painting from the 15th century called Madonna and Child with Infant St. John. It was painted by Dominica Gerlando, and it's located in the Palazzo Vecchio Museum in Florence, Italy. So if you ever get there, you can go see. Uh, it's Mother Jesus. She's seen looking down, right? And in the background, this is what you have going on, right? Can you see this? There's this guy, right? It's very hard to see from the back of the room. It's hard for me to hold my thing still. But there's this little guy standing on a hill or a cliff. And he's like, he's doing this. Like, he's looking up. And he has a dog next to him. Can you, I don't know if you can see that, but here's the dog. And the dog is barking at this thing in the sky, and this is the thing in the sky blown up. It's kind of unusual, right? This is the, a painting 
called the Annunciation with St. Amidas. It's painted by Carlo Crivelli. It resides in the National Gallery in London. It shows a circular object shooting a thin beam. It's okay, thank you for even trying. You can, hopefully you guys can see this okay. Here's the object in the sky, and it's shooting a beam right down into the Virgin Mary's head, supposedly. And it's like a ringed cloud bank. Here is a close-up of it. Kind of looks a little bit like a crop circle in the sky or something like that. And it's very interesting it's shooting a beam down into the Virgin Mary's head. When I look at this, I get the idea that there's something telepathically communicating with her, possibly. We don't really know, but the painting was painted. This is a large blue mural that appears in the Vasaki the Vasaki de Kanti Monastery in Kosovo, Serbia. What's very interesting is that it's a painting of Christ on the cross, and here and here on the wall are these like, what are these? Are they like little spaceships? Are they stars? They seem to have exhaust coming out of them, and there's little men in them. And the men are looking back or looking down at Christ. Does this imply that Christ was, you know, extraterrestrial or had spiritual beings or, you know, we don't really know. But it's interesting that it was captured in, you know, gosh, the 1350s, right? Here's another very interesting painting. This one is called The Baptism of Christ. It's uh, painted by a Dutch master named Ert de Gelder. And... Here, the baptism that's going on uh, with people surrounding it is sort of being highlighted or lit by a UFO that's in the sky with these beams coming down on all four sides. It was painted in 1710. It now resides at the University of Cambridge in England. It's quite fascinating. Here is a painting done... Um, in the 15th century. It is a, a Dutch painting. There are two ships at sea, and in between them is this light orb phenomenon going on in the sky. Now, it might be very hard for you to see in the back of the room, but there are two kind of circles, a small one at the top and a big one at the bottom. The top circle at the top has three faces in it, very clearly looking out at the observer of the painting, and the bottom one has a larger face and it's kind of like a vesica Pisces, so it's really quite fascinating. Now, this is one of my favorite ones. This is a painting done of an event that took place in 1783 at Windsor Castle. It's uh, reported by a man named Thomas Sandby. So what was going on is a whole group of people were standing outside, either right before or right after dinner, apparently smoking, as the article goes. They were outside smoking cigars. And all of a sudden, they see this light orb. So this blue light here, or this odd orb, transverses across the sky, stops and starts and sputters, moves in erratic ways, and then all of a sudden takes off at lightning speed. And they all saw it, and they recorded it as part of uh, you know, the royal family history. This is a very famous painting done by Hans uh, Glasser. It's a woodcut, actually. It's an event that took place April 14, 1561, um, in Nuremberg, Germany. Okay, so this is an air battle that literally took place, and everybody in the town was watching it and seeing it. So the descriptions say a massive air battle took place with uh, many craft in the sky, a large dark missile uh, in the sky with a lot of globes and cylindrical spaceships. What they thought was the sun also seemed to appear in odd places. So a very bright light appeared and then went out. This woodblock accompanied a news article uh, that was written about this because in those days, of course, there were no cameras. So when you wanted to create a visual for people, you literally had to create a woodblock to print your paper, right? And that still exists today. This is an object, 17th, uh, I'm sorry, it's a painting from 1430. It's located in the Church of Santa Maria Magorio in Florence, Italy. 
It's a wall fresco. And here I've given you two visuals of the same wall fresco because when I go and I research this, I probably saw this when I was in um, you know, Italy, in Florence, many, many years ago. Like, I traveled with this musical road show called Up With People. And I know we visited a lot of these museums, but I wasn't, like, tuned in to the UFO thing, so I probably didn't even notice it. But, of course, many times when you look at this, you only see this visual image with a group of people standing in a town and these things in the sky that you might think are clouds. But when you see the full image, which I've shown you here, there's Jesus and Mary, and they seem to be on the top of a cloud in a ring looking down. Now to me that looks just like the Sumerian images we saw where there was a ring and like wings and guys you know usually holding their hand out from the wing or the ring I'm sorry. So it's just really really fascinating. So if you want to look this up further it's really really fascinating. It's uh, painted by Masolino de Panicol and again it's located in Florence. Now, this is a very, very interesting story. There are many references and text to this story, and it's in Japan. So I'm just showing you that there are images all around the world. I could have brought up images of Vedic tradition, too, and Indian and Vedic craft, but you know, there's only so much I can talk about in an hour and 10 minutes for you. So this is the story known as Utsubune. And it's from the date of this story is February 22nd, 1803. So this odd, unusual boat or disc or craft is in the water off the coast of Hatachi, Japan. One of the stories says that it drifted to shore and this woman got out of the craft and she was carrying a gold box in her hand and she couldn't speak the language of the people that were there. She was described as having very pale skin, red hair, and very long, thin arms and legs. And she was only about four and a half feet tall, which is not unusual for, for Japanese. I'm not saying the height is, is unique, but these were the descriptions that appeared with it. And this appears in probably about 15 different texts in Japan. And it appears in paintings and things like that. And so it's really a significant story. What's also very interesting is symbolism that was recorded. These geometric shapes of circles and triangles that were apparently on her craft. And her craft was described as having windows all around the top edge of it that were made of crystal. And the bottom of her craft seemed to be very, very sturdy. They said it was made of gypsum and it could resist rocks and it had a, like a tarry, sticky surface to it so that it floated. It's bizarre. So one of the stories is that like a, a fisherman found her at sea and towed her to shore. And then they tried to communicate with her and they couldn't. And since you don't want to be talking to a single beautiful woman, and she also had very unusual clothes. She was described as having like beautiful fabrics that they'd never seen in her clothing was very shiny. And since they couldn't communicate with her, they decided to tow her back out to sea. It's, it's bizarre. Now the reason I bring this story to your attention is these same symbols were recorded in the Rendlesham Forest case some other people may be talking about that case today, but it's a very serious UFO case. Happened in Rendlesham, England. Uh, in England, there are two air bases right next to each other. One is called RAF, Bentwater, and the other is called, um, I'm sorry, there's the, the RAF, English, British military base, and then right next to it was Bentwater's military base, which was American. And in between them is a forest. What we were doing in 1980 is moving nuclear, small usable nuclear weapons we were storing in underground bunkers there, getting ready to deploy them in Poland. This was during the Reagan-Gorbachev buildup. And UFOs flew in and rendered those nuclear weapons inert. And we, the US tax dollar paying American citizens, lost millions and millions and millions of dollars when those nuclear weapons were rendered inert. But that, of course, is not the first time that ever happened. But the craft that appeared had these symbols on it. So there seems to be overlapping themes in UFO history. So now we're going to jump and look at early um, newspaper articles. So <clears throat> this was an airship that appeared in the call 
and this was November 23rd, 1896. Um, let me see what I want to tell you about this. This was, it's just the artist representation. It was a drawing that was done um, for the newspaper. It makes me think that this craft was seen because it appeared in many, many, many newspaper articles. As you'll see here again, these were other airship drawings shown in local papers. It looks awful lot to me like the Hindenburg, doesn't it? It looks just like the Hindenburg. And uh, even this depiction here, you can sort of see a basket on the bottom, almost like a, a helium balloon that would go up, except it was very long and may have had some kind of propeller system in the back. I suspect that probably about 20 years before the Wright brothers were flying, there were experiments going on, and this craft appeared all over. There were like something like 65 or 70 newspaper articles depicting this craft. And it um, probably crashed and burned like the Hindenburg, and then all of a sudden you never saw this again. The reason I'm showing you these is because artists tend to draw what they see, right? Our, you know, the reason the, the crafts were painted the way they were in the 15th century paintings, the reason I think the Sumerians drew them and depicted them the way they needed to and the way these crafts are painted, they're all different, but I think they're specific to what was really being seen. Now, in the Second World War, there was a phenomenon that many pilots uh, reported, both German and American pilots. These were called Foo Fighters. And Foo Fighters were these odd orbs of light that seemed to show up on the wingtips or near the wingtips of fighter pilots and would accompany them, sometimes fly around them. Some pilots even believed they protected them. There were some times when these orbs would fly in front of them when the, when the aircraft was being fired upon. And the bullets ricocheted off these orbs of light. It's really quite unusual. This was a very close kept secret, never really discussed during the Second World War, but reported both by um, Russian, Russian uh, fighter pilots, German fighter pilots, British fi fighter pilots, and American fighter pilots in their records. So this is a very unusual case. Um, and it, there's just, you know, I'm, I'm pulling out some important things just for you to kind of grapple in your brain historically how these reports have come down through history. So this is one uh, famously known as the Cape Girardeau, Missouri case from April 12, 1941. A local sheriff called a Baptist minister named Reverend William, who is right here, to come to the scene of a crash or what he thought was a plane crash to offer last rites to passengers that were about to pass away. And of course the reverend said, absolutely, of course. So the sheriff sent a car for him to pick him up so he didn't have to find out where it was. And they get to this site which is about 18 miles outside of the town of Cape Girardeau. And the reverend gets out and he can clearly see this is not any plane crash. It's a disc in the ground. And part of it's ripped open, and there are two small alien beings on the ground. Um, there's a fire that's been put out. The local fire department is there. The cornfield was on fire. He can see that that's smoldering. They just put the fire out. And he's about, and he sees odd hieroglyphics, he reports, on the side of the craft. Now, he's just about to kind of go up, open his Bible, these being, well, I think one of them was still alive and one of them was dead, and he's about to offer last rites over these small, you know, large-headed, big-eyed creatures. He doesn't even know what they are, and he's freaked out. And the Army Corps of Engineers show up from Sykes and Airfield, like this whole command module on, you know, military jeeps, and they start hollering at people. They've got armed rifles. They're yelling, get away, get away, get away. And they're all, you know, cordoned off on the side of the street, and they're told, you do not speak about this on pain of death. We will, not, we, will, we will hurt you and we will harm you if we know you're speaking about this. This needs to be kept totally top secret, and um, this is a military operation now, and you're never to speak of it again. So on his deathbed, Reverend William tells his wife, because he's so traumatized by this, and he knows that it happened beyond a shadow of a doubt. I mean, he knew the people in the town. He knew the firemen and stuff that were there. And his wife, on her deathbed, told their daughter. 
uh, because he, he had left a journal and he'd written about this. So the daughter's name is Charlotte Mann, and in 1970, she started going to UFO conferences and sharing her father's journal and talking about it. So now we're going to jump to 1947. This gentleman right here is Kenneth Arnold. This should be a review for many of you in the room, but Kenneth Arnold was an, uh, an aeronautical engineer, and he was a pilot. And he was flying over Mount Rainier, which is in Washington State, over the Cascade Mountains. There was actually a search and rescue mission sort of going on, and though he was on a, in his own private plane, and he was on a mission to do something else, he thought he'd take some time and see what he could see for this search and rescue mission going on. Well, lo and behold, he sees what he describes as four, not sorry, four, nine, nine blue glowing disc-shaped objects traveling at a speed that he estimates to be 1,700 miles an hour in a V-shaped formation. He described them as looking like um, stones that would skip on a water, like if you can throw a flat stone, you can get it to skip on the water. He said that's what they were doing. They were like, zip, 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 like they would almost jump in and out of reality and they would change shapes and they were moving so quickly and they were reflecting the sun. I mean, at first he thought it was like balloons or something because he couldn't figure out what he was looking at, but they were traveling so fast. And as a pilot, you have to know what the airspeed is because that's going to throw off you know, your flight right pattern. And he realized, no, the airspeed was consistent, and he realized he was looking at disks. So this stunned him. He came back and described seeing flying saucers, and the term flying saucer stuck from this incident. Now, June 24th is before Roswell, right? This is this is a month before Roswell. So the next major story that takes place is on July 4th, 1947, this rancher named Mac Brazeld, who was just a foreman. He was working on a ranch called the J.B. Foster Ranch, which is outside of Roswell, New Mexico. It's about an hour from, from Roswell, New Mexico. And he rides around on his horse and he checks the fences. Yeah, if, you, if you've watched Yellowstone, you know what ranchers do, right? They go out, they look for their animals, they check the fences, they check for calves giving birth and things like that. He comes over a ridge and he sees three quarters of a mile in front of him a debris field that's a couple hundred feet wide and it's just, it just goes out in front of him, all this weird debris. And he's shocked by it. He thinks, oh my God, there's been a plane crash, what, you know? So he runs back, calls the police, the local police decide they're going to call the, R, the um, Roswell Army Air Base, which was in Roswell, New Mexico, and they sent out people to inspect the debris. So this gentleman named Jesse Marcel Sr. comes out to inspect it, along with uh, Cavett, Colonel uh, Sheridan Cavett, and another person I don't have pictured here named uh, Master Sergeant Bill Rickett from the Army Base. They all drive out in um, two Jeeps from the military base, and they get there and they're shocked. They realize this is really bizarre. They don't know what it is. They're picking up pieces of metal that kind of look like aluminum foil. They can wrinkle them up in their hands, right? or they're picking stuff up and they start to put it in the truck and the Jeep because they know they've got to drive back and show the military base. And as they bend stuff and put it in the Jeep, the metal material pops back out when they get, rid of, get you know, let go of it. So if you take aluminum foil and you wrinkle it up, you know aluminum foil stays all crinkled up. But not this type of aluminum foil. It bent back out and it's now been recalled memory metal. We know now how to make this. You can Google memory metal and look it up. But this was 1947. So they drive home with this debris and they drive back to the military base. But of course, they're there all day. It's an hour drive out, an hour drive back. And Mac Brazel is out there and they're standing around talking. Jesse, very interestingly, decides to go home first. He wakes up his 11-year-old son and shows him the material and then gives him a little box of stuff so that he can have himself because Jesse is convinced this is a, this is a craft, you know, that some, some major collision happened. Now, there's no craft on the ground here. Two discs crash in different places. The, the um, one is called the crash of Corona that, um, uh, what's his name, Stanton Friedman wrote about, and there's another crash in San Augusta, but apparently two disks collide, and they think the reason they collided is we were experimenting with radar at this point in Roswell. 
The Roswell Army, Army Air Force Base was the place where we were storing and transporting the nuclear bombs we dropped on. Or I'm sorry, sorry, they weren't nuclear yet. They were, well, they were basically that. They were hydrogen bombs. We dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So those bombs were stored there, left there, transported onto ships, right, with planes that then took them and, and we eventually de detonated them in Japan and it ended the Second World War. This was a highly sophisticated military base. They were also putting up weather balloons all the time to see if anyone else had developed atomic weaponry because we could see it in the upper atmosphere. So they put up weather balloons all the time but they knew what they were looking at. They knew this was debris and it wasn't from this earth. So um, what happens next, okay, is the military comes out the next day, sees this debris, and it's a massive operation. The other thing that happens is that the local uh, general at the base in, Army, in, in, the, in Roswell decides that he's going to announce it to the local papers and the local radio. So this is a headline from 1947. July 8, the headline comes out, Roswell Army Airfield, right, captures flying saucer on a ranch in the Roswell region. And then, of course, very famously, what happens the next day is the whole story gets squelched. And these are the pictures that appear on local newspapers. So what happens is they take all this debris back to the uh, Roswell. They fly it eventually to Wright-Patterson, but they stop in Fort Worth, Texas at an army base there. And Jesse Marcel is flown with the debris, right? And Colonel William Blanchard asks Jesse to come in for a press conference. He thinks they're going to be announcing that, you know, we now have a UFO crash and Jesse has found it. And they asked Jesse to kneel down alongside of a crashed weather balloon debris and take pictures. And Jesse realizes he's getting set up to take the fall to act like he misunderstood a weather balloon you know, crash, which is about the size of one of these round tables here. It's not three quarters of a mile of debris. And he takes the fall for misidentifying this material and the story gets, gets hidden basically for about 35 years until Stanton Friedman, this lovely man here who's a nuclear physicist, is giving a talk one time in Arkansas on UFOs and he is approached by someone in the audience that said, would you like to speak with Jesse Marcel Sr.? He lives not more than an hour from here and he's been wanting to tell his story for a long time. And the rest is history. Jesse uh, Marcel meets Stanton Friedman. Here's the picture of Jesse when he's older. Um, and Stanton writes many, many books about this, as well as other people. And I actually have a book list in the back, which you can pick up. It's free. It's at that table where there's all these things that are free you can pick up. Uh, both Do uh, Tom Carey, who might come up and speak. Uh, Joe might decide to bring Tom Carey up. He just lives down in uh, lower New Jersey. He and Don Smith have written numerous books about Roswell, because the Roswell story involved hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in the town of Roswell. And it's definitely really, really happened. Now, Edgar Mitchell, who's standing here with me and some other friends, were loading his dishwasher, which is very fun. Edgar Mitchell grew up in Roswell. He was 11 years old at the time, the same as Jesse Marcel Sr.'s son. He ended up becoming an astronaut, working for NASA. When he came back from his Apollo mission, he was on a uh, tour for NASA and he was in a parade in downtown Roswell. And senior military officials approached him and said, you know that the, all the stories about Roswell are true, don't you? You know. And he said, well, basically, I am have astronauts and myself. I mean, I can't talk about what I saw. But he told me, we're not alone. He had a very profound experience coming back from the moon. He started a whole organization called IONS in California, which you can join and learn about. Nowadays, IONS is sort of a little more out there in terms of studying things like ESP, psychic phenomenon, and when you go to one of their conferences, they invite you to go out and do ayahuasca with them. They're like really out there. Dean Radin works with them. You know, they put people in ferret in cages and see what they read in telepathic communications. It's amazing. But that all started because of this man, Edgar Mitchell. 
He's um, really a forefront thinking man, wrote a number of incredible books, but he told me personally, yes, we are not alone, and there's lots of stuff out there. Um, now, a very famous event, July 19th, 1952, we had uh, a number of craft show up over our capital. Uh, these were first picked up on radar, right, by um, the National Airport, now called the Ronald Reagan Airport, just a few miles from the capital. A flotilla of craft, about 10, 15 different craft, were moving very, very quickly. They were picked up on radar. They came and stopped over the capital, which is a no-fly zone. So when you have craft sitting over top of the U.S. Capitol, it's like, hmm, all right, <laughs> something's up. Many people believe that was a sign or a signal that we began to have agreements at that point with extraterrestrial um, groups or some kind of galactic federation. Because 50 years to the date, there was another experience like this in 2002. So these objects move in, jets are scrambled, F-16s are scrambled to fly up over the Capitol, figure out what's going on. It's a really big deal, it's a big kerfuffle in DC. It's on a lot of ham radio people uh, are picking this up and you know tracking it. And um, basically what happens is the jets show up, circle the Capitol, and all these orbs just blink out. Boop, they're gone. And then the F-16s go back to the base and land, and boop, the craft are back. They were there for about 20 minutes. I know a man who was 19 years old at the time and saw them himself and told me about them. So UFO stories were making national headlines, and it was a kind of a bit of a problem. From 1947 to 1952, UAP events, right, seemed to be increasing, according to a man who wrote a book, his name is Edward Ruppelt, and his information is in the back. He wrote this book that's shown here in the middle called uh, The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. Ruppelt held the Army's uh, internal research team together, and he investigated UFOs from the late 40s straight through till 1952. He worked under Harry Truman, who witnessed this massive buildup of sightings that were happening. It's important to realize that in 1952, from January to June, there were 16,000 articles making front page newspaper covers in national news all across the United States. We don't see that today, but it was a really big deal. And Truman wanted to really squelch the hysteria that was going on. So he pulled together a whole group of people. He got the Intelligence Advisory Board together, the newly formed Central Intelligence Committee, the National Defense and Research Committee, and the Office of Scientific Research and Development. And these are some of the pictures of those groups that I found on the internet for you. They were basically pulled together to convey a big conference and a meeting to discover or decide how they were gonna deal with the media frenzy because Truman wanted this secret so he employed this man named um, Howard uh, P. Robertson. He had an interesting background. He served as the director of Weapon Systems Evaluation Group from the 1950s to, or from 1950 to 52. He also served as a scientific advisor to NATO. He was a top mathematician, PhD. So he was to head up, like the top scientist, right, to head up the scientific panel. And they were to produce what's called the Robertson Report, which they did do. And they presented the Robertson Report before Congress in 1953. Um, I think I have one copy of the Robertson Report in the back, but this is basically what it looks like. You can go and read this yourself. And in fact, I should mention this, if anybody wants my notes that I'm reading from today, I've got three copies, I give them away because I write it on my laptop and I have it. So if you're really interested in further researching this material, you can take my notes with you. So you can go and read the Robertson re Report. Basically what it did and what it said was, in, in brief, in short, it was trying to figure out a way to contain what people were reporting. And basically they were 
to work with the media and tell the media that people just don't have trained eyes and they are seeing things they don't know how to explain. And to an untrained eye, it can look like a UFO, but really what it is is things like swamp gas and unusual cloud formations and things that, you know, if they were scientists and experts, they would understand. So they also decided in this report, it explains how you squelch the issue. They said, we're going to involve Hollywood, and we're going to get Hollywood to make movies about literally flying craft and little green men and make it look really silly so that it adds to the ridicule, ridicule factor. So when somebody starts to talk about this, they, are, you know, they can be easily laughed at. And let me tell you, the ridicule factor is hugely effective. Since they couldn't do away with the sightings, they had to come up with a way to kind of make it look unimportant. And essentially what happened at this period of time is um, Congress agreed to adopt it because there was a fear that mass hysteria would overwhelm our communication signals and we needed to have the military to be tightly in control of what was going on in case there was some kind of invasion. It was literally what they were talking about. So that's when you get all this secret groups like MJ-12 getting created. So Edward Ruppelt, he was a, a decorated war a veteran. He was a pilot during the, during the war. He flew battle missions over Germany. And he was in this group called the Air Technical Intelligence at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And he was the first one to be assigned to start studying these UFO sightings. Because let me tell you, the military and the, uh, you know, took it very seriously. So from 1947 straight through to 1952, there were all these different projects that were funded to study UFOs. Project Sign, Project Twinkle, Project Grudge. Notice Project Grudge, the name change, Grudge, right here, right at this point in time in history. In fact, it was October 1948. The government decided they were going to start to really squelch this from even within the government. They were trying to figure out how to hold the lid on it and they were already starting to debunk Edward Ruppelt. But he actually wrote a great book and it describes everything that went on, like the veil of secrecy and how it started. Now, right at this period of time in 1948, there was this really significant uh, crash of a Kentucky Air National Guard, a pilot named um, Thomas Mantell. He was on a routine flight and his commander called him on the radio and said, hey, there's this huge UFO. We seem to think we don't know what it is. It's in this area. Can you fly over and see it? And he sees it, and he radios back on his radio. Oh, my gosh, it's a craft. It's a disc, and it's of enormous size, and it's moving at a high rate of speed, and it's climbing way high up. It was, like, down at, like, a 1,000 feet, and all of a sudden it was, like, moving quickly up to, like, you know, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet, and he decided he was going to chase it. Now, his jet that he was flying in, apparently it didn't have oxygen or he didn't have his oxygen mask on because he was at lower altitudes and he just went after this craft, probably lost oxygen and crashed. But the other wingmen who were with him saw it and they saw the craft and they saw what happened to them and they were afraid that possibly the craft could have shot something at him or attacked him. So then there was this fear, oh my gosh, UFOs are attacking airmen. This made national news all over and this is kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. And we, uh, as Edward Ruppelt writes about, he explains that uh, they just really needed to contain this. There was huge stigma going on, and they decided they were no longer going to call these craft flying saucers. They were now going to call them unidentified flying objects because that sounded a little more intelligent, right? And uh, now when he went out, Edward Ruppelt was hired, of course, by the government, and he would go and make reports to military groups. And when he would go in a room, there would be sometimes 10, sometimes 150 high top brass military generals, people in charge of aeronautics, uh, engineers, scientists. Nobody laughed. You could hear a pin drop. He would give assessments of the situations that were going on. 
at sometimes once a month, he would fly around the country out of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He'd walk into a room, everybody would get quiet, sit down. He'd have like a projector and, you know, not these types of projectors, but the old types of projectors. And you know, he'd be explaining stuff that was going on and questions would be flying back and forth. I mean, this was really like a high secretive thing within the military. But of course, they just decided to, to squelch it all. So this is basically the historical process of what happened. Edward Ruppelt was demoted in 1951, like, I think. He was told he was no longer allowed to speak to any commanding officer that had a higher rank than he, and he was a captain. He was no longer to, able to speak about the UFO topic. Now, when Ed, Edward Ruppelt was in, in charge of this research, he reached out to J. Allen Hynek, who was an astronomer at Northwestern University, and he brought him in as a scientific advisor. What the government decided to do is turn Project Blue Book, which Ruppelt was running, over to Hynek. And they gave Hynek instructions that what he was to do is to come up with tricky sounding scientific explanations about what was really going on and that it was just swamp gas and, you know, astro, air, you know, cloud, you know, uh, disturbances, and that people really didn't know what they were seeing. But really what happened, it's interesting, we'll explain it a bit later, but at the end of his life, Heineck really ended up believing that this was true. So Heineck, Heineck was given the job of running Blue Book, right? And Blue Book was no longer a serious um, group within the military. What it became is a public information gathering campaign where you, the public, could report to the government what you saw. But what the government eventually realized is, well, if we're letting people report what they see, they're waiting for an assessment of the situation. They're waiting for congressional hearings on all these sightings that are on the front page newspapers all over the United States, right? The public wanted to know what was going on. And really, newspaper reporters were getting really frustrated because they were never getting the information out of the military. And we had a place we could report it. So they decided, okay, we're just gonna, we're gonna close Blue Book. It went on from 52 to 69. And the way they were gonna do it is they created this Condon Committee. This gentleman by the name of Edward Condon, who was at the University of Colorado, was a high-level scientist, and he pulled together a new group of scientific advisors, and they decided they would, you know, pre... It, it was very interesting as a memo was found. It's famously called the Trick Memo, and Condon wrote it the week he was given the assignment to have a two-year committee research UFOs and come up with a report. And the trick memo he wrote back to his friend, uh, Mr. Lowe, said, oh, we're just going to basically, you know, debunk the whole topic. So our Condon report ha is going to have this outcome. And it famously came out after his death. Now, comics have a wonderful way of telling you what's really going on when you don't really get it from the press, right? So here's a comic. This is the Condon Committee that Edward Condon pulled together at the University of Colorado. And here's a craft, right? And here's beings pulling Edward Condon up and onto a craft. So in 1969, the Condon Report came out and basically said, oh, UFOs are no issue to us. It's just unidentified phenomenon, and there's nothing to worry about, and it's not a national security issue. And... Um, so what happened after that is J. Allen Hynek decided he was going to start his own organization. He started an organization called KUFOS, and he wrote a number of books himself because he really began to believe that this was a serious issue and needed to be uh, studied seriously. And uh, there was the very first ever, uh, Heineck and this other man named Jacques Vallée approached the UN. And they said, okay, our government isn't willing to look at this seriously, so let's ask the UN to do this. And they held the first ever UN committee meeting on November 27, 1978. I have some close friends who were at this meeting. Lee Spiegel, um, uh, Stanton Friedman was there, Peter Robbins was there, and the... Um, Head of Grenada, let me see what is his name, Carey was his name, uh, Kari, uh, 
Let me just look at my notes here for a minute because I don't always remember all of these names. Yes, his name was, um, he was the ambassador of Grenada. His name was Sir Eric Carey, or Gary. He sponsored this UN committee, and it was a full day panel of people speaking on UFOs at the UN. Jacques Vallée was there. They were saying, look, this needs to be an international world cooperative movement because no one single government can really handle this, and we need to talk internationally about about what's going on because UFOs are seen absolutely all over the world and they've been they've seen been seen throughout history. Jacques Vallée was well aware of this. A week after this event, the president or the ambassador of Grenada was deposed. There was a revolutionary coup and the US took over Grenada and you never heard about the UFO topic again at the UN. So you can see how serious this is. There was actually an aide of his that was shot as well. And I think that's what made uh, Gary be quiet about this because he realized he would be at risk as well. So people lose, have lost their life over this topic. Gordon Cooper is a very famous astronaut. He witnessed a craft in 1957 over Edwards Air Force Base. And this is a fascinating story. I'll just tell it to you briefly. Uh, Edward Cooper was also an astronaut, as you know, and he was, there was an air show going on. He was uh, there with a film crew, planned to film new aircraft, new military craft that was going to be displayed. So the film crew standing on the tarmac next to a runway, all of a sudden this very unusual craft comes in, right, comes in, lands, puts down landing gear just beyond the runway in a dry lake bed. And it's a disc. It's about a 40 shapes wide, a 40 shape wide uh, silver disc, puts down landing gear and drops down a stairway. And the film crew is, is like, oh my god, they're, they're thinking this is the military <laughs> material they're supposed to film. So they run up to the craft with their camera equipment and they film it. They get about 15, 20 feet from the craft, the stairway goes snaps up, they stop, right? The craft takes off, takes off at lightning speed. They're all standing there trying to figure out what's going on. Gordon Cooper is like, okay, this isn't the military craft we were supposed to film. Um, they go back, report what's going on to Washington. Within like seven, eight hours, men in black show up, take the camera. They never even processed the film out of the camera. Men in black basically just showed up, high-level military people. You're not to talk about this, nothing like this. Now, like 20 years after this event, I was at a conference in Lachlan, Nevada, and a gentleman confirmed the story to me. Actually, he spoke at a whole conference. He confirmed it to everybody who was there. Basically, he was um, a, tele a telephone man. He was on a high telephone pole at the military base fixing like phone lines there. So he saw the whole thing from the top of a telephone pole. He saw this disc like flying over top of him. He was like, what the heck is that? In fact, he says there was static in the lines that he was working on. So this probably really happened. And Gordon Cooper wrote a book um, about basically UFOs. So just to tell you, when the Condon report was closed and you were told that UFOs were not a big deal, apparently the UFOs didn't get that memo, right? Because they've been showing up ever since. In fact, long before Roswell, 1941, there was a big battle over Los Angeles. Thousands of people saw this. I don't know if you know about this. This was in Long Beach where all our military craft were sitting. I mean, our military ships. We were preparing to go into World War II, and we had like 15 aircraft carriers sitting in Long Beach, and a huge craft showed up over top of it and was observing what was going on. And we actually got out tanks and shot up at this thing. It went on for like four or five hours. Everybody in this area in Long Beach knew this was going on. It was called the Battle Over LA. So what I have done is I have, as you can see, two full slides here. You see these are two different slides. These are a list of some of the most significant UFO sightings which have happened since the 40s, straight up till today, right, 2017. And I have a handout of these on paper in the back which you can pick up. 
I'll also just tell you, not that I'm selling anything or that I care about selling anything, but if you like videos and you like films and you like to tell younger generations about what's going on, I have over here some documentaries I made about some of these events. I made a documentary about the 1975 Travis Walton case. It's a group of loggers who were in the Sick Graves National Forest, seven loggers that encounter a craft. And that DVD is in multiple languages and it's got closed caption on it for people who need uh, to, uh, they, need, they can't hear very well and they need to see it. There's a very famous Betty and Barney Hill story. I think I have one or two DVDs of a film I made about that. Um, I also have a film about James Forrestal. James Forrestal was our first Secretary of Defense. He was most likely lost his life over this subject because um, he was well aware of it. There was a lot of um, what I'll call allegations that he was taken to the um, a military base underground and communicated with the only living alien who survived the Roswell crash and apparently lived for a number of years. And Forrestal was given telepathic communications by him. And because of that, he was most likely thrown out of the 16th story window at Bethesda Medical Hospital. And I have a film about that, about James Forrestal. So if you're interested in some of these things, pick up the thing in the back or get it here because we could be here all day talking about these. So now we're just gonna talk about today. What is different, right? What's going on that is suddenly making things, you know, very apparent to everyone and all of you and why we're seeing UFOs on the front page covers. So um, there's no one single thing that has completely changed, but a whole combination of complex things which have changed. A lot of the very famous debunkers have died. And I say, thank God. You know, they always say that um, science advances one funeral at a time. And it's not really that untrue. As people with closed-minded ideas and, you know, strict religious ideas that won't allow them to think outside the box, that's how we slowly move forward. Another thing that's happened is our digital optics have just gotten a whole lot better, right? And uh, the other thing that's happened is the craft are still showing up. They never seem to get the memo, not that they weren't real. And we have had numerous group uh, meetings that have gone on, things like the citizens' hearings that happened in Washington, D.C. in 2013. If you don't know about them, I highly uh, suggest you watch them. They're free and they're online. They're on YouTube. You can watch them. These are high-level generals and pilots and military people, people moving or storing nuclear weaponry who talk about what has happened to them and their families as a result of what they've seen. Just last week, Literally, I think last Wonesday, Robert Salas, who wrote a wonder, wonderful book called Faded Giant, he was guarding a Minuteman missile in 1967 in Maelstrom Air Force Base, and it was rendered inert by a UFO that flew up over top of his Minuteman missile. Not only that, this happened about 65 times over a period of about seven or eight years in the 60s into the early 70s. So these intelligently operated craft have a real clear idea of how dangerous our nuclear weaponry issue is in our country. Uh, and when I watched this program, I learned something like, there's something like 23,000 or 35,000 nuclear weapons now all around the world. And the issue is, we may not be stupid enough to blow one another up, but what is very likely that can happen is the basic human error, right? Or a computer glitch, or a system process, or two things that don't talk to each other anymore, right? I mean, you see the problem we have just trying to get audio to play from a DVD player. Think if you're working in a nuclear weapon silo, and you've got a nuclear bomb under you and you have a tech problem and you can't stop something from happening. So these intelligent beings uh, know what's going on. So I just have a few more comments about another five minutes. Are we okay on time? Okay. So 
Ben Rich, he was the director of Lockheed Skunk Work. So nowadays you have top, top level people speaking out about this topic. So Ben Rich gave a very famous talk at uh, the University of Southern California alumni community. And he was talking about all the stealth uh, aircraft that are being built by the Skunk Works. And at the end of his talk, he said, we have aircraft that you won't see the light of day for 30 to 50 years. It's buried so far deeply under black budget projects. This is a quote from his talk. The other thing he said is, if you can imagine it, we can build it. And at the end of his talk, he showed a slide of a UFO, and he said, in fact, we're so advanced, we have the technology to take ET home. Now, a lot of the alumni in the audience, they were engineering you know, people, computer people, IBM people. They kind of laughed, but a whole group of MUFON people were there from Los Angeles, and they went right up to him and talked to him for 15, 20 minutes between him leaving the lecture podium and getting in his car. And there was no doubt about it. He was totally serious. So you have top-level people coming out and speaking about this now in ways that we never had before. The other thing that's really different is we have made major improvements to the Kepler satellite that's up in space. It's been taking you know pictures of our Milky Way. And we now know that the, the habitable planets that exist in our own Milky Way are huge. Just to give you a sense of this, okay, we can now estimate that the number of suns in our own galaxy is around 50 billion. That's B, with, you know, with a B, not million, billion. So that's suns we, ha we know in our own Milky Way galaxy. Now, the number of planets far outnumber the number of suns in our galaxy by three to one, okay? And they're far more common than, say, large gas giants like Saturn or Jupiter around other suns. So of those 50 billion suns in our own Milky Way galaxy, there could be upwards of 500 million potential Earth-like planets that could be in the Goldilocks zone. You heard that? 500 million potential Earth-like planets. So the likelihood that life, as it has started here on Earth, may very well have started somewhere else in our own Milky Way galaxy. Now that you have your brain wrapped around that, you know, I'll just ask, has, have any of you in this room actually seen the Milky Way like standing on the ground in the night sky. It's a really amazing thing. I'll just tell you this briefly. A number of years ago, I went to Peru to go to Machu Picchu and, and um, you know, some of the ancient sites out there, Puma Puka. And there's very little light pollution when you're up in the Andes Mountains. And, and you can see amazing constellations in the sky that you can't see up here, like the Southern Cross. And you know, for me, when I look up at the night sky, there are times when I almost weep. Well. I never saw the Milky Way, because I live in Philadelphia, and I live where there's a lot of light pollution, and I'm standing there at, at night, we're kind of doing a night watch to see if we see any UFOs, and I say, hey, look at that, there's like, there's like this band of clouds, and it's going from this, you know, hemisphere all the way over to here, like it's like a rainbow of clouds, like, that's weird that you can see clouds at night, and I'm standing there, and I'm like trying to figure out, like, what's going on, and the other people that are with me are like going, Jen, like, you know, like, that's the Milky Way. And I'm like, that's the Milky Way? Like, I can see the Milky Way? Like, I suddenly had, right? Like, I was seeing all the bands of our Milky Way. Do I have a picture of it back here? Not, not really. Yeah, okay, so this is what our galaxy looks like, right? And what I was doing was, like, I was looking through it. Well, for me, it was profound because, like, I literally started to cry. Because you have a sense of place. You have a sense of self in this greater universe. Now, let me just share what just happened in 2015, okay, which is not that long ago. This gentleman named Bill Williams, 
he works with the Space Telescope Science Institute. And he, for years, had wanted to commandeer the Hubble telescope and point it in the darkest region of space. He'd been wanting to do this for like a decade. And he said, can I get together like 100 hours or like four days worth of time and just point this telescope that we have, which we can see deep you know, into space. I want to point it in the darkest region of space because we don't know what's out there. And all of his friends and you know, people in the industry said, well, well, that's a waste of time because there's nothing there. So you're, you know, we've got so many projects, it's so important, and this is such expensive equipment. Like, no, we're not going to do that. So it took him 10 years to convince people this needed to be done, and he had to save up his own time. It took him um, like four or five months to save up enough of his own time that he had with a telescope so that he could condense it all into this four-day period of time, and boom, we pointed this telescope into the darkest region of space, and nobody thought we were going to see a thing. But guess what? We suddenly realized, because light travels over distance in time, so if you don't keep the telescope pointed in the dark area of space for more than a couple of hours, there's not enough time for the light from very distant galaxies to come into the telescope. So I don't know if you can wrap your brain around this, but we knew about a couple of other galaxies besides our own but we didn't know about millions of galaxies beyond our understanding. So our understanding of the size of the universe, just like, right, it's like an atomic explosion. So when you take into your grasp or understanding of that, the potential of life existing somewhere else is now astronomical. Now here's some really interesting things that have happened in the latest news. You may know about this, you may not. October 19th, 2017, a major asteroid appeared. It came into our solar system. It was spotted between Venus and our sun. It moved in in a very unusual way from other asteroids. Um, it kind of came in at a very high rate of speed, and it was very, very large. Had there been, say, a collision of this and Venus or uh, Mars or something like that, we would have felt the effects of it. I mean, it would have been cataclysmic for our own solar system. That's how large this thing was. It was, I think, like 10 miles long, something huge. It came in at a very high rate of speed, then it slowed down, and that's when we were like looking at it, paying attention to it. Now, we couldn't completely see it, and the way astronomers notice things like this is they know where the positions of all the stars are and what they can see. And when they see something moving that's reflecting differently, like alarm bells go off and they go, oh, 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 we got to look at this thing, we got to pay attention, like something's changing here. So they only pay attention to things when they change based on what they know, right? Just like Laura was telling you earlier here, how the radar trackings were showing that, you know, the solar flares were like going up. When something changes, from the norm, that's when we pay attention. So this um, object was coined the, the term Amuamua because it was picked up by the Pan Sears Telescope, which is in the Haleakala uh, volcanic crater in uh, Hawaii. So they pick this thing up, it comes in, high rate of speed, slows down, almost stops, makes a 90 degree turn, then takes off in another direction. Not typical for an asteroid. Asteroids normally have outgassing and other things like that. So the head of Harvard's astronomy department is named Avi Loeb. And on December 19th, 2018, he came out and clearly stated to the press, we've been visited by an artificial interstellar craft. It had no, none of the contemporary outgassing, no visible tails, no, which is caused by ice evaporation usually off of the asteroids or comets as they go by. He called it the mother of all motherships has been spotted in our own solar system. 
So that's what's changed, because in 1950, the head of the astronomy department at Harvard University was Donald Menzel. And Donald Menzel was probably part of the NI, uh, what, what was it called, the uh, uh, National Security uh, Institute. Um, blanking on what the letters are for that, but he was in charge, of, he was part of MJ-12, NSA, thank you, that's what I'm looking for, NSA. He's part of the squelching and the hiding of the UFO issue. In fact, there were many letters back and forth between Kennedy and Donald Menzel, where Donald Menzel said to Robert Kennedy, when we are properly cleared, I will be able to tell you more about what's going on with unidentified aerial phenomenon. It's a really uh, interesting letter. Uh, Stanton Friedman has looked at Donald Menzel's uh, material and we're really clearly of the understanding he was part of MJ-12 and he knew very well what was going on and didn't want anyone to know. In fact, he wrote UFO debunking books. But today, the head of Harvard is coming right out and telling you we've been visited by extraterrestrial craft. This is the citizens' hearings which took place. I mentioned it earlier. The retired Canadian Secretary of Defense, whom we just lost, he just died. He was a lovely man. He spoke out about, you know, this. You didn't have heads of the Defense Department speaking out about UFOs in 1950. In fact, they were murdered when they wanted to speak out about it. And that's what the James Forrestal film is about. You have the head of Bigelow Aerospace, Robert Bigelow, speaking in 2019 to, or I'm sorry, 2017, right on uh, 60 Minutes. He claims that UFOs are here, they're real, and we're in communication with them. You have Luis Elizondo from uh, the former Pentagon program that he worked on, which is called the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. It's typically called A-TIP. When you hear A-TIP, that's what it stands for. So he worked for that project. He also spent a little bit of time working on the project before that, that Harry Reid got a lot of funding for. Senator uh, Harry Reid was the um, uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, under, I think, Reagan, not under Reagan, under um, uh, Bush. And he was able to commandeer a lot of money to study different things. So we put funding together uh, to have another program which was known as ASWAP. That stood for the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Program. Because we always want to look at this from the side of, well, how can we use this to build better weapons, right? So ASWAP and ATIP were programs that spent $22 million dollars to research this. And finally, Luis Elizondo, whom you're probably familiar with, you've seen him all over the news, we had him come and speak for the MUFON uh, National Symposium in Cherry Hill that I had the pleasure of running. It got dropped on my lap. But, you know, I've, and, and poor Luis, I don't know if you can see this or not, he walked around at our conference with a bulletproof vest on. And he left early because he had life threats on his life, but he's standing there sweating because he's wearing a bulletproof vest. So when Luis Elizondo decided to leave the Pentagon because nobody was taking it seriously, he realized there's a threat issue, maybe not a serious threat issue, but we do, we are being visited. He knew it. He couldn't report on it. He had a job and a budget to do right, a budget to do a job that he couldn't do, and he finally decided to go to Harry Reid and he said, it's time this is made public. And in order to do that, we need to have a well-orchestrated plan. So for a year, they worked on how they were going to release this data. They approached three major journalists, these three people here, which are uh, Helene Blumenthal, Leslie Keen, I'm sorry, uh, Ra Ralph Blumenthal, Leslie Keen, and I'm blanking on her name at the moment. Uh, Helene Cooper, thank you, here I have it. So they all planned how they were gonna write this article together, right? And it broke December 16th, 2017. And basically, I have copies of the article in the back you can take with you. It was called Glowing Auras and Black Money. And it was the beginning of the unveiling of this topic. 
And what Luis Elizondo and Harry Reid did is they got people inside the Navy to agree to release camera gun footage. These are high, complicated infrared cameras that are on our military jets that can track and lock on you know, UFOs and track them. Now, I'll just take a minute, because this is really significant to understand. I mean, a lot of people see this and they think, OK, it's one UFO. What happened off the USS, uh, for the USS Nimitz, along with some other aircraft carriers in 2004, I believe it was, off the coast of California, there were five or six uh, aircraft carriers all lined up about two to three, maybe five miles apart in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Los Angeles, basically. And they were testing new types of radar, okay? <laughs> Usually a ship has its own radar on the top of its masks, and what they were doing is they were flying new radar on jets that would go up above all of the craft, and, or all of the ships, and they would link with certain Bluetooth technologies, all of their radar together, so each ship on the ground could see like 250 miles around them rather than 50 miles around them because they had linked radar. Don't you know they had a five-day military operation plan to do maneuvers, like practice maneuvers with their equipment so everybody understands, okay, this is the program you use, this is what it tracks, this is what it looks like, you know, so you know what your video screen looks like, you know what information you're getting, you know how to use your, your guns and things like that. Those five days worth of military operations were shut down because a flotilla of craft showed up at 80,000 feet the morning they were supposed to start their military operations. Not one craft, a flotilla. There's probably 15 craft at 80,000 feet. So the radar operator, Kevin Day, on, the, on one of his ships on the Nimitz said, you know, I can't really like send jets up there because like, boom, we're gonna have collisions up here in the sky. It's gonna be a mess. So he sent one of his pilots up, David Fravor, to check this out to see what was going on. So these, a bunch of like glowing tic-tac orbs, or not orbs, they were real physical craft. They looked like elongated tic-tacs. And they were at 80,000 feet, then they dropped down to 20,000 feet. David Fravor's up there, he's flying around, he can see them. They start tracking him. The other jets are up there seeing him. Then all of a sudden these tic-tacs, boom, right down to the water level, dropping 20,000 feet at water level, dispersing the water on the ocean. And the jets are like, oh man, did you see that? Yeah, I saw that. They dropped down. To, they're seeing these craft in the water. Then all of a sudden, boom, the craft disappears. They don't know where they are. They're back up there at the top at like 20,000 feet. Then they, the jets go back up at 20,000 feet. Boom, the crafts are back up at 80,000 feet instantaneously. This threw off our operations. Now this has gone on twice that we know of. It's the USS Roosevelt off the coast of Florida in 2015 this happened, 2004. So I believe it's happened many, many, many times. But anyway, long story short, Luis Elizondo knew if you just have an article in the newspaper, nobody's going to see it. These days, you got to actually release the gun camera footage. So he got Harry Reid to let his inside people in the, in the Navy release the camera footage, and it got posted to YouTube. So you had the videos come up, that's the Go Fast videos, and then the newspaper article simultaneously broke. That's why the media took it seriously, because they knew inside people were coming forward and wanted this out. So Luis Elizondo and Harry Reid, who are pictured here, are all over the news. They're talking. This goes on for about a year and a half. You see them constantly. And basically, the news people say to Luis Elizondo, you know, are there intelligent species that are operating these intelligent craft? Like, all they were talking about is craft that outmaneuver our own, you know, technology. And Luis said several times, he got pushed into a corner and said, well, you know, like, we're not really talking about the intelligent beings, but the craft seem to have intelligence behind them, so you figure out what you want to call that. You know, like, he wasn't allowed to talk about the beings, only about the craft. Something else that's very, very new, some of you may know about this, some of you may not, Penn State University announced they were raising $110 million to create a college or a school to study this topic seriously. 
and they had just raised $3.5 million to endow a chair. So they now have an endowed chair, and hopefully eventually they will have a college where people can go and get a PhD in this subject. Unless universities begin to take this seriously, we can't continue to have you know, legitimate open discussions about this because the stigma about it is still really huge. Another thing Penn State did, they've had a very enlightened dean for, for years. In 2000, they had did a five-year, or they produced a five-year interdisciplinary study about what would happen to life on Earth here if we had contact with extraterrestrial beings. What would change? So it's from psychological perspective, agriculture perspective, military perspective, um, you know, health and wellness, technology. I mean, it's a really, it's a huge report. It's like, I don't know, a couple thousand pages. And you can uh, order it or buy it, you know, but you didn't have that happening in 1950, but you have it happening now. Now, I thought this was really funny. You know, I didn't expect this, but it's really quite logical. And it just shows you how back-assed lots of our military and government is. 2017, we had Luis Elizondo coming forward, right? And the military gun camera footage was out there. But the people that filmed the gun camera footage and the pilots who were chasing these UFOs couldn't talk about it because the Navy had never given them clearance to speak publicly about UFOs. So the Navy was kind of caught like with its tail and a trap behind them, right? And finally, in 2019, the, it broke in the news that the Navy had finally decided that they would allow pilots to speak about this, and then suddenly you saw David Fravor all over the nightly news for about six months. So that's what's different now, and it all ties back to radar, right? And this is Kevin Day. I'm standing here with Kevin Day. Kevin Day was the radar operator on the Nimitz who saw the flotilla of craft over their five aircraft carriers and realized something serious was going on. So now these guys can come forward and begin to speak. Um, there's also astronauts coming forward. I've just two more slides. This woman, Helen Sharman, she's a British astronaut. She went up to the Russian Mir space satellite. She actually came forward and said, uh, this is only recently in January uh, 6, 2020, the BBC broke this story. She said, aliens exist, there's no doubt about it. Um, there are many different sorts of life forms as well among us in the billions of stars that we know of. Um, she is at the Imperial College in London now and she's a chemist. She said it's possible that these species or these different beings are right here, right now, and we just simply can't see them. A former Israeli space security chief also came forward just recently. This is December 7th, 2020. His name is Chaim Eshed. And he shocked the public when he came forward and said, yes, there are extraterrestrial species. We've been in contact with them. We even have a contract with a galactic federation. I mean, this made uh, the Jerusalem Post and it made the National Times, but it didn't make the front page cover. But you can go back and dig these up, and I have a list of them in the back to go look up. He stated extraterrestrials um, are real. Um, he said uh, they don't believe that humanity is ready to know about them. So part of the secrecy is being controlled by the other species that are here. I think they kind of look at us like we're, you know, um, like we might think of not wanting to go live amongst the Taliban, right? <laughs> they wouldn't be able to handle me if I went over there and tried to live and speak about this topic, right? I'd be killed or murdered. So I don't feel safe going into communities where people don't understand or know me. And I think the ETs look at us and say, we have a lot more evolution to go through. So he is the former head of the Israeli Defense Space Department. He's a very high level, respected, retired engineer. He said, aliens are much like us. They are equally curious about humanity and the Earth, and they are still seeking to understand things they don't quite understand about the fabric of space. 
Eshed went on to say that cooperation agreements have been signed between these different species. There are underground bases on the moon and on Mars where American astronauts and alien representatives have worked cooperatively for decades. It's an incredible statement when you think about it. He's gone on to say that um, aliens think people are not ready to know about this. So these are the changes that we are seeing in the modern era over the last 20 years. This is new. I mean, you see, we're talking about 2000 forward, and most of this stuff is 2017 and forward. So we're in the first six or seven years of this opening up and us under, understanding what's going on. And additionally, we're getting ready to make manned missions to Mars. So how can we possibly believe that some other species hadn't evolved like us somewhere else and traveled to other planets? It's preposterous to think that we are alone in the universe. So the message I want to leave with you is that um, it's you know, inevitable that we eventually need to come to terms with extraterrestrial intelligence and species elsewhere in the universe and possibly right here on our own Earth. And that happens with each of us indiv individually. It's a psychological digestion process. It's not easy to deal with, especially when you see something and then you are ridiculed for it. And my heart really goes out to a lot of the people who have had abduction experiences because they're really like a victim group, sort of like, say, women who are victims of domestic abuse and feel like they can't talk about it, right? Or people who are under suppression for companies they, they work at, or people who are gay or who are lesbians and they're criticized for what they believe and think and how they feel. So they have support groups for them. But there really haven't been support groups, really, yet, openly, for people who have the awareness that we're not alone in the universe. So I encourage you to digest this material and allow it to inform you and have courage to go forward in your own life, continuing to research and explore it. And I'm going to say thank you. And I think we're on a time constraint, right? So. We'll do questions. We'll do questions later, probably during our panel. Yeah. Okay. okay thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Thank you, Jen. That was a great presentation.